The title of this lecture is Faith in Women, the Changing Role of Women and Girls in the Ministry and Music of the Church. And as a kind of taster for what I might say in the lecture, in the publicity you will have read, walk into any church or cathedral today and you might hear women singing, preaching, praying publicly. In a society where the relevance of the church is constantly questioned, has this change made any difference and does it matter? I hope that by the end of the lecture we might have some clues as to the answer to that question. Given that I am a woman and trained as a singer, albeit a long time ago, given that I'm a priest and have committed my life therefore to public ministry, it's a little difficult right at the beginning of this lecture not to reflect that I will simply spend the next 50 minutes or so saying yes to those rather basic questions. I hope that I might say yes in a relatively entertaining and interesting way though, but having set the question, does it matter? I will offer the answer yes, in the hope that this might prompt further yeses down the line. But I do want to start by saying that this acceptance of women and girls is obviously not a done deal. Although girls' choirs, as you've just heard, three of whom are performing together in the festival on Saturday, although girls' choirs are much less controversial than they were, they're still an exception in an overwhelmingly male Christian musical world. For the first time in 2013, a woman conducted The Last Night of the Proms, and it's a story about Marin Alsop with which I want to begin, as I think it illustrates something of the complex emotional territory we get into as soon as we start talking about women, girls, religion. She and I were on a panel in 2011, organised by the LSO, talking about Joan of Arc as part of a weekend of music about Joan. Marin also had conducted to critical acclaim Arthur Honegger's 1935 dramatic oratorio, Jean d'Arc au Boucher. We were discussing a variety of topics related to women, religion, and music. We discussed the power of public gesture, for example, in the life of both a conductor and a priest and the role of conductor, instrumentalist, singer, priest, as having in common our role as interpreter of something from beyond ourselves. To illustrate some of this struggle that this inevitably brings for her, she commented that she is a frequent flyer across the Atlantic. Having found her seat in the plane and fastened her seatbelt, occasionally the announcement, good evening ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking, is made by a female voice. Despite Marin Alsop being one of the most authoritative women in the world, she admitted that so striking is it that a woman is in charge of this aircraft that she sometimes has a momentary, a fleeting but real reaction. Blimey, I hope she can fly the plane. <laughs> There's a moment of frisson, unsafety, uncertainty, followed by an overwhelming sense that, of course she can, don't be ridiculous, she's had the training, she's just as good as everybody else, and so on and so on and so on. I respected her very much for telling that story because I do think it gets under the skin of some of the issues that I hope to highlight today. It gets under the arguing about the presenting issues, such as boys' choirs and women in cathedrals, and finds an emotional connection with something that I do think is more common than we might like to admit, which is trusting women, the issue of trust, trusting women with traditionally male roles. Today is the feast of the birth of John the Baptist. You'll remember that his birth is miraculous to the aged Elizabeth and Zechariah. And so shocked is Zechariah at the impending birth of his son that he loses the power of speech until the birth. The set readings for today from Luke's Gospel illustrate the themes of silence and speech, male and female, as the man, Zechariah, is simply unable to name his son. Elizabeth tells the assembled crowd, his name is John. They refuse to believe her, as none of their other relatives have this name. In the end, they simply don't accept what she says and ask Zechariah, who can't speak, but writes on a tablet, his name is John. Today, therefore, is the day for the Benedictus, the Matins canticle which celebrates light and peace in a dark and antagonistic world. As one who presides at the Eucharist, whose public gestures after the example of John the Baptist 
are pointing away from myself to a greater reality as one who sometimes sings in that presidential role. I'm aware that for most of the two billion Christians in the world today, the vast majority have never seen a woman do this or have never heard a woman pray or sing publicly in the liturgy despite attending acts of Christian worship every week. Even though the subject of this lecture, I presume, is timed to coincide with the Church of England's vote this summer on the consecration of women bishops, it's important to state right at the beginning that we're in a small minority in believing that women can combine their historic role as musicians with new public roles as priests, and that this combination is a sign of holiness and the presence of God. In most Christian liturgy, women remain cast as Elizabeth, speaking personally, but not publicly, waiting for an authoritative male voice to name what they already know to be true. One more ground-clearing point, if I may. I guess that the default reaction, the go-to responses to this subject, circle around girls and boys choristers, about women presenters or deans, about the idea of doing even song responses are up an octave tonight, and female adult singers in the back row. Although some of what I say might have implications for this, I'm not predominantly talking about these as issues. Because what often seems to happen is that the lines are drawn not so much spiritually and theologically as culturally and emotionally. Priests like me, who were among the first women to sing the office and the Eucharist so publicly, all have our horror stories and battle scars, and I don't propose to rehearse them here. But to return to my core question, the changing role of women and girls is happening, but does it matter? Does it make a difference? In a recent Radio 4 interview, the composer Judith Bingham, who's written a piece commissioned for the festival, as you heard on Saturday, noted that she, she does think that girls make a different sound when they sing from boys. Boys have what she called a youthful edginess and ethereal top notes. Girls have a more mature sound without the voice change that boys experience and often have more power in the voice. Choristers are a bit older and sometimes are already having voice training, she commented. As a composer who writes for the church, she sees it as part of her role, writing for a repetitive and traditional liturgy, to what she calls freshen the familiar. And girls and women singing in church is part of that freshening the familiar. Of course, women music makers have had an honoured place in the practice of ancient public religion. In the Hebrew scriptures, we find many women making music. Miriam at the Red Sea leads her people in song. The women of Jerusalem welcome King David back from battle with singing. Deborah the judge sings in victory. Jephthah's daughter first rejoices in song and then instigates an annual lament among the women of Israel. In the New Testament, the women of Jerusalem sing laments at Jesus' crucifixion, and ritual mourners weep and sing at the death of Tabitha in the Acts of the Apostles. Imaginative writers have given us Mary's lullaby to her child at Bethlehem, the most famous of which is probably the Coventry Carol of the 16th century. And the song of all songs is given to Mary in her Magnificat, after the tradition of Hannah. This song, repeated at Vespers and Evensong each day, is a song of revolution, a new world order. Jesus would repeat this song of the prophet Isaiah when he unrolled the scroll in Nazareth to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. We often meditate on and learn from Jesus' relation with his Father in heaven, but in his song of liberation, it's clear he was his mother's son too. In the Christian tradition, however, following the anxieties of St. Augustine, Aquinas and others, the association of music with inappropriate inflaming of the passions and the close association of music itself with the feminine has meant that these early assumptions that women could take a public liturgical role were forgotten. There were, of course, some spectacular exceptions, though. One of the earliest is the 8th century abbess Cassia, probably born and certainly raised in Constantinople. Sometime after 843, she founded a monastery in Constantinople and there are about 50 hymns of hers that remain and over 20 of them are used currently in Eastern Orthodox liturgy. 
Her voice is passionate and witty. In one of her hymns, she seems to list the kinds of people that she doesn't like. But she writes poignant poetry, such as the hymn for the feast of the presentation of Jesus in the temple. How do I bring you to the temple who is beyond goodness? How do I deliver you to the arms of the elder? From Cassia in the Eastern Church to the 12th century Hildegard of Bingen in the West. Astonishing in its daring and exuberance alone in style and content, more recently Hildegard's music has found a new audience. Her music stretches the female voice over extremely wide vocal ranges, up to two octaves, large leaps, florid melodies. She writes the character of Mary in her morality play, Ordo Virtutum. The part has a range of 14 notes, soaring and plumbing the extremes of human experience. Hildegard's own theology is reflected too, a particular care for the earth and for creation, but also thoroughly local, her chants and hymns combine the heights of heaven with the concerns of a community of women striving to keep their vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. In this way, she gives us music that is both transcendent and imminent, <coughs> theologically adept, and also practical for daily life. Ordo Virtutum is written for 18 female voices and one man who was Hildegard's secretary. In order to model in this lecture right now good theological practice, it seemed important to me not just to talk about women singing or writing, but to embody it by including live performance in this lecture. And so as I've been talking about Hildegard, we should hear from her. I'm really delighted that Jan Coxwell has agreed to come and sing for us this afternoon, and she will now sing an extract from Hildegard's Praise of Mary, the Mother of Christ. Hildegard's voice is a free and singular voice, without parallel in her own day. Some other headline figures stand out from the past, the 12th century Queen Blanche of Castile and the 17th century Italian composer and singer Barbara Stozzi. Both these women were of noble birth and their music has survived across the centuries. In Naples in the 15th century, it seems that women minstrels, including one Anna Inglese, English Anna, were so popular that special lodgings were constructed for them. Women musicians in the cathedrals, however, were few and far between, although the remarkable story of Todora Ginés tells us 
uh, though she was born in 1600, tells us that she was born of African descent into slavery, but in the first half of the 17th century, she and her sister Michaela showed remarkable musical gifts, despite a lack of formal musical training. For this reason, they were freed to enter the service of the cathedral at Santiago de Cuba as musicians. Theodora played bandora, a plucked bass instrument, and bowed bass. Her sister was a singer. Together with a Spanish violist and a Portuguese shawm player, they formed the nucle nucleus of the cathedral's orchestra. For some women, it seems, exceptional musical talent was even a route out of slavery. These are exceptional cases, but they do give a sense of history for the contemporary woman attempting to find her voice in today's church. I'm not essentially going to argue for an intrinsic difference between men and women's music, because I don't believe that music arrives on a cloud onto a composer's page. It's the result of individual imagination and inspiration, yes, of course, but also, crucially, the context of the commission, the context of the performance, the relationships surrounding it that underpin and inform the intensity of the music itself and arguably give it its meaning. At the heart of the composition process and performance is a mystery articulated by James Macmillan. How is it that mathematically organized patterns of sound are capable of inspiring such great emotion? And as Catherine Pickstock observes, any musical tradition contains implicitly views about time, about space and eternity, the emotional and the rational, and the individual and the general. Clearly, women do not have homogenized views about these things. And in that sense, the music that women will make will surely be as heterogeneous as men. Cultural that soundscapes which express particular belief systems will be more influential than gender in this kind of intrinsic way, I suggest. But one thing that women do have in common is a historic silence. The music we've just heard from Hildegard was banned. In itself, it was simply too much. The, women, the music that women make in church today is born in the historic experience of being silenced. For any of us who've spent any time planning liturgy, creating orders of service for various occasions, we know that, as a desert father put it, silence is God's first language. And all music finds its home and origin in silence. One needs the other. But the silence from which music comes and to which music returns is an uncreated silence. It's not the silence of the silenced. Whenever this kind of silence is present, the Christian theological thrust is to end it. The nature of God is not in the end to remain silent, but to utter. God speaks. In the beginning was the word that sung the whole of creation into being. On the cross, Jesus utters his seven last words. Notwithstanding the meditations on what he said, the fact that he speaks at all is a lesson for all those who suffer, who are constrained, pinned, as he was, by the political and religious assumptions of his day. So I want to set the singing of women in English churches in a self-consciously global and historical context. There's been much debate in the media in the last month or two about the relationship between women and religion, not only in the debates within Christianity about the role of women in leadership, but about the education of girls in Nigeria, about violent attitudes towards women in India, even the debate about the traditional page three model from the free copy of the Sun newspaper distributed to all UK households a couple of weeks ago and why it was omitted. As one commentator has put it, we live in a half-changed world. Old assumptions about what women can and should do have been challenged, but it's not yet clear with what they will be replaced. 
And alongside this challenge has come a strongly reactionary counterblast, which insists that women will remain controlled physically, especially sexually, intellectually by maintaining illiteracy, and spiritually by reinforcing the social apparatus that often accompanies religion in its definition of the roles of women and men. Religion has a hugely influential and potentially liberating role to play, but the role is for good as ill, good or ill, as we shape together the society we live in. In previous centuries, the action taken against women in England in order to stop them speaking or singing was violent, bridles, physical restraints. Those of us who are women in this generation must count ourselves the most blessed among women because we can sing and speak in places that for generations women simply couldn't. The privilege of this is enormous and will remain so for a long, long time. It's startling in some ways how quickly women speaking and singing publicly in church has been normalised, and of course we're glad how quickly that can happen. But in the words of Emily Dickinson's mystical poem, it is in brokenness that true song finds its expression. If we split the lark, as she puts it, of women's experience, we find the music buried deep inside a history of silenced singing. Much of the music of the past has been made at a high cost to the musicians in the tradition of Cecilia, the patron saint of music, the scarlet experiment of which Emily Dickinson speaks in her poem. Split the lark and you'll find the music Bulb after bulb in silver rolled, scantily dealt to the summer morning, saved for your ear when lutes be old. Loose the flood, you shall find it patent, gush after gush reserved for you, scarlet experiment, skeptic Thomas. Now do you doubt that your bird was true? I return to my core question. Does it matter that the lark is split, that women and girls now sing in liturgy? It matters very much in a global context because girls and women are still bridled and silenced in this generation across the world. We sing now because we can, and we sing as a sign that things do not have to be as they are. At a recent conference concerning the place of women in the Church of England held at Lambeth Palace, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, was commenting on comments that Professor Sarah Coakley had made earlier in the day. And what he said was this. What is needed in our church today is a prophetic theology of gender. That's a way of talking about men and women in the body of Christ, which goes beyond both a rights scheme and a facile, complementary model. Men do this, women do that, and lo and behold, wonderfully, they fit together beautifully. How do, how do we get beyond a secular, rather two-dimensional discourse about rights, and what can sometimes be a rather unhelpful mythology about complementarity, to something that's really social, historical, actual, personal, relational? There is a strand in theological thinking currently that might be helpful here as we consider the changing relationships within the church between women, men, music, and God. Dr. Williams has been speaking about this recently, and although he hasn't applied it specifically to gender, it seems to me to be pertinent for our subject this afternoon. The theological reflections are centered around the key question of human identity. Our starting point for our identity is in a recognition that for every person, our identity is not primarily located in our relationships with each other, which are secondary, but in God's relationship with us. This can transform the place of women and men together in the public exercise of religion because it changes our perspective 
from a sometimes rather over-anxious emphasis on what we might call the horizontal relationships. Who am I to you? What is my comp role compared with yours? Who am I in relation to you? It challenges all of that and restores what we might call a vertical perspective, that our origin and destination, our security and our purpose rests not in one another ultimately, but in God. And it is as this person, the person loved by God, that we live ourselves. And it's knowing that this is true for others as well that governs our relationships with them. The Russian theologian Vladimir Lossky was writing in the first half of the 20th century, and he set this agenda for the theological reflection on identity. Before we're in relationship with anyone else, before we relate to our environment or other people, we are paid attention to, we are loved, by God. That's our primary relationship. And as such, we are a person, not merely an individual. Dr. Williams's conclusions from this assertion are that we ascribe personal dignity or worth to people, to human individuals, because of that sense that in relationship, each of us has a presence or a meaning in someone else's existence. We live in another's life. For good or ill, I am in your life right now. You're in mine. To be the point where lines of a relationship intersect mean that we can't simply lift some abstract thing called a person out of it. We live in another's life, and our primary relationship is with God. A further reflection that follows from this, which becomes relevant for our reflections on gender and music, particularly with reference to our gender, is that our identity is clearly embodied. We notice that our bodies are different from one another, that they wear out, and that we are going to die. As a result of us noticing those three things about our gendered bodies, we could learn to live in such a way that we accept difference, that we expect change over time, and that we expect death. Of course, the opposite is also true. As a result of noticing these things about ourselves and about each other, we could become more fearful, more determined not to submit ourselves to this sequence of bodily realities. But the potential is there for an attitude towards life, towards music, towards religion, that would make these differences energizing and exciting rather than threatening. Does this very simple reflection on our own gendered selves give us a starting point for a theology that recognizes difference, that expects change over time, and that accepts death, and that knows ourselves to be ourselves only in relation to others, when we know ourselves to be ourselves first in relation to God. What follows from these two principles is that our own identity, our personhood, is brought to life in our encounters with one another. And I want to suggest especially our musical encounters with one another. Dr. Williams has put it boldly, we live in another's life. That is, we come to life in another's life, and our personhood is more than the sum of the facts that we might know about ourselves. This, it seems to me, is another way of expressing theologically what happens musically in the dynamic of a choir or a group of instrumentalists. In a group of singers, for example, we as a group sing music given to us by the composer. As we sing together, as we will do in just a moment, we must sing the part we've been given, otherwise another will miss their cue, which they're listening for. Similarly, we must rest when we're asked to, otherwise another's voice won't be heard. Sometimes the voice we're using is in a dissonant relationship with another, and that's the composer's intention. When we use our voices, we sing into another's silence. Historically then, the music making, if it has been done only by men, 
has been done in the context of women's silence. That this silence has now ended will bring as yet unimagined consequences for the creativity of spiritual expression that is untapped when women write music as free agents without constraint. This mutual recognition and acceptance of sound and silence means that all of us, men and women, are given the chance to find our own voice and to use it. We also recognize the imperative for us to be freely silent in order for another's voice to be heard. To try to illustrate some of this, the next piece is a piece by the contemporary composer Judith Bingham, written for two sopranos and an alto. To help us reflect on the theme that our primary identity is in God, also to illustrate that we live in another's life, we sing in another's silence. This piece is God Be In My Head by Judith Bingham. Many thanks there to Caroline Trevor, who joined us for that piece. This brings me to the next point about women and girls in the church, and that is related to the previous discussion about identity. One of the cardinal virtues of Christianity is one that was in much in the past, was one that was taught much in the past more, pro more predominantly than it is today. And it is one that's been especially associated with the feminine and that is the virtue of humility. The chance that women have now is to relearn what has in the past been a rather debilitating requirement of them, that they acquiesce and give way. It's a chance to discover what we might call a redeemed humility, that's based not on an unequal power relation or a confining fear, but a life that's lived as a person a free citizen of our gendered state, accepting difference, expecting change over time, expecting death, and expecting resurrection. This means, too, that there is a potential for the discourse about gender to be transformed. We can potentially move from what is often, often seems like bafflement between men and women, I simply don't understand you, through tolerance, I accept that you're different and will agree to disagree. Through to respect, still implying distance perhaps, but with more emotional commitment. 
through to what we might call attentiveness. And music can help us in this, because we must be attentive to one another for music to be made well. For professional musicians, this attentiveness, this listening while singing, being acutely aware of several voices while using our own, becomes second nature. But for the rest of us, it is a prophetic challenge to live in this way, with the potential to point the way to a new way of relating. I went a few weeks ago to a women's prison to spend the afternoon doing a music workshop with the prisoners. In the chapel, about 30 women assembled, loud, glad to be out of their cells, not sure what to expect, and some not a little aggressive. Over a couple of hours, we sang together, learned our parts, practiced our rhythms, and while we were at it, told the story of Holy Week and Easter. The atmosphere slowly changed from a highly competitive, combative, and edgy conversation to what at times was a really beautiful harmony and even some measure of peace. I was reminded of the 15-year-old Alberta Hunter who ran away to Chicago from home in 1907, aged 12, as she'd heard she could make $10 a week singing. Later on, she wrote this. The blues are a part of me. They're like a chant. The blues are like spirituals, almost sacred. When we sing blues, we're singing out our hearts. We're singing out our feelings. Maybe we're hurt and just can't answer back. Then we sing or even hum. When I sing, I walk the floor, wring my hands and cry. Yes, I walk the floor, wring my hands and cry. What I'm doing is letting my soul out. For the women in prison, and some at the workshop had been in prison for the last 30 years, making music together was a transformative way of relating to one another and also to the staff present. It required a level of attentiveness in a safe environment, of attentiveness to others, unusual in such a combative place, and also a willingness to be heard amidst others, to find a voice that simply became more beautiful because it was not alone. In some ways, Alberta Hunter had it right. When I sing, what I'm doing is letting my soul out. And this finding of a voice, making music in a sacred context, is a way of reclaiming that inspirational but problematic virtue of humility I mentioned a moment ago. Humility in the past had been used to teach women that their place as Eve's inheritors was to be silent. Other groups have, of course, suffered from this too. But the insistence that women remain in the domestic fit sphere and not in the public sphere kept women inaudible in public liturgy for almost the whole of the Christian tradition. But theologically, when any person finds their voice and learns to use it, they are free then to make way for others but the voice has to be found first. To put it another way, the paradigm of Christian living is the picture of Jesus washing his disciples' feet. For women, this has traditionally been their habitual role anyway. The path to salvation for women is first to learn to stand before they choose to kneel. This is not an enforced or gendered humility, but a redeemed humility, available to everyone, that is a principle of living. In our arguably increasingly competitive and combative world, it's a distinctive contribution that Christianity can make. The third piece uh, to help illustrate this lecture is a setting of George Herbert's poem, Easter. We've already heard an ancient prayer of the church, set by the innovative and singular Hildegard. We've heard a vernacular prayer set by a contemporary woman. And this third piece is the poetry of the Anglican priest and poet George Herbert, set by Cecilia MacDowell. And to prove that in this lecture, inclusion is the name of the game, 
I'm delighted to say that we're joined by the countertenor Patrick Craig for this piece. This is Rise Heart, Thy Lord is Risen. And so some concluding observations. What's the difference and does it matter? For some of the reasons I've sketched out, I hope that I've shown that it matters very much. On a global stage and in the context of the past 2,000 years, women who sing in public liturgy today are still pioneers, however normal it may seem day to day for some. Women and girls are not taking part in public liturgy because they have an inalienable right to do so, or because they want to join in what the boys are doing, or because they want to spoil things, or because they want to be let in, or because they're cross. And I've deliberately not talked too much about equality or justice in this lecture, as I simply assume with this audience at this festival in 2014, I just don't have to make the case that women are irreducibly equal to men. Unity in religion and music is not the same as uniformity. Even if the last 2,000 years of exclusion hadn't happened, the character of humanity, of men and women, as those created, redeemed, and transfigured by God in Christ, remains true. In response to this, the human institution that is the church finds a way, muddled and often uncertain, to align itself eventually with these dramatic and soaring truths. Women and girls should have an honoured place in the public practice of religion, because in liturgy, in this distinctive practice of the church, the created worship the creator and offer the best and the most of who they are and what they can do. 
I want to end with a challenge to us women. In answering the question, does it make any difference and does it matter, at least part of the answer must lie with us. The challenge is not simply to put on the clothes we're given and try to blend in without anyone noticing. It's very tempting to do that. And of course, a certain amount of this is advisable if you want to keep your sanity. But I suppose it's also right to note that blending is a key skill for musicians that requires a strong commitment to listening. But fundamentally, the inclusion of women and girls just as a thing in itself isn't a box to be ticked on an inexorable path to a better future. Neither is it, on the other side, an inevitable and regrettable sign that the church is modernizing. Women are no better able to shape a vision for the future of our society and church than men. I hope that music colleges encourage women composers, alongside writing their piano concertos and string quartets, to write for the organ, for choirs, and encourage them to find inspiration in the texts of Christian liturgy, both ancient and modern. I hope that directors of music, presenters and deans will commission women to write, helping them to find their distinctive voice. For women ourselves, with a fundamental recognition that our primary relationship is with God before it is with each other, with the cultivation of attentiveness and redeemed humility, the task for women, alongside men, is to claim the freedom that we have, to sing with our own voices and to invite others into that song. It is still a new thing and a brave sound to hear the authentic voices of women raised in praise of God. And so the potential is actually the same for women and for men in finding a freed voice. It is to be brave, to find your courage, listen hard and sing. Thank you.